Uh, I'm recording this video on August 12, 2020. About 10 days ago, I watched a video by uh, Tim Gordon, Richard Duclue, and Christopher Plants. It was a, a very interesting video, and it was about the Second Vatican Council. And the question they were addressing is, how do we deal with the Second Vatican Council? Do we throw it out? Do we try to make some changes? What do we do? And that was the discussion. Um, there were two points that I wanted to talk about in connection with that. One was the idea of what counts as Vatican II? And then the second thing is, uh, is there any significance in dealing to Vatican II versus the inflammation of Vatican II, uh, which came afterwards? Um, Tim uh, started out by talking about what's the original meaning, what's the meaning of the Vatican Council? How do you decide um, what a council teaches? And uh, Tim is a lawyer, and he brings in this very useful concept of um, textualism. And he said, basically, um, a council or a law um, means what the words say it means, as they would have been commonly understood by the people of the time that the uh, document was created, whether it's Vatican II or a law. So he says it's the original public meaning. Uh, it answers the question, what does the document say? And I think that's a very handy way to understand what counts as, as the teaching of Vatican II. It's the 16 documents, it's what they actually say, and uh, as understood by the people of the time. So it, it has nothing to do with what people intended, what the bishops were thinking, or anything like that. It has to do with what the document actually says. Uh, Tim then goes on to say that the documents of Vatican II contain what he calls muddy water. Sometimes he calls it um, soft spots or pitfalls. And so he, he sees those as problems. And he's, uh, Tim seems to depart, as he goes on talking with his two friends, uh, from his original position, and he starts considering intention more than just what do the documents say. And then he brings up for criticism what Pope Benedict taught about the need for uh, what he calls a hermeneutic of continuity. Pope Benedict said that when you are dealing with one of these muddy spots in the document, when you're dealing with something in the document that, be, that can be taken uh, in various kinds of ways, you need to interpret it uh, in, the, in continuity with what has gone before uh, in the teaching of the church. And Tim feels that because uh, you have to say that, um, that shows that there's a problem with the, with the documents themselves. In other words, the documents shouldn't need um, an interpretive key that explicitly says you have to be in continuity with the past. That should be, um, that should be uh, obvious uh, in the document itself, in the documents themselves. Uh, I tend to disagree with that. I think that Pope Benedict talked about uh, a hermeneutic of continuity. What he's really saying is a Catholic hermeneutic. In other words, when you're reading a document from a Catholic ecumenical council, you have to read it in a Catholic way. And if there's anything in the document that could be understood in a heretical way because it's poorly worded or ambiguous, uh, you, would, you still interpret it in a Catholic way. He was saying that not so much because of any fault in the documents, but he was saying that because there were actually people after the council who were interpreting the council in a heretical way. So uh, the reason for the, the Pope's um, insisting on a hermeneutic of continuity was because of people interpreting the documents heretically. It wasn't because of the faults, supposed faults in the documents themselves. Uh, Tim also mentioned uh, that uh, Father Skilovex, um, during the time that, that the council documents were being written, 
uh, said that he uh, would was uh, encouraging the bishops to introduce into the documents ambiguities which later heretical theologians could interpret in a heretical manner. Uh, well, again, that doesn't tell us what the Second Vatican Council taught. That tells us what Father Skilovex wanted it to teach and what he said he, that he would say it taught after the council. But uh, Father Skilovex did not vote for those documents. He wasn't a bishop of the council. And so what he intended uh, by encouraging certain things to be put in the documents and what he said those things meant later are irrelevant. They are not the teaching of the council. So I don't see that whole Father Skilovex thing as relevant to what did the Vatican Council teach. Also, and I think um, Rich DeClure may have mentioned this, um, not all the bishops, uh, we don't know what the bishops had in mind there if you're going to go with intention. You don't know what they had in mind. You only know what they actually voted on, what the actual text was. Um, and there may have been some bishops who, ha who were mischievous and wanted to put in a, something heretical. Uh, and there, may, there undoubtedly were bishops who wanted things to be orthodox. We don't know how many of which there were, of each group there were. We have no way of knowing that. But again, that's intention. That's not the documents themselves, the objective documents themselves. Uh, Tim refers to the power structures of the council as trying to get ambiguous teachings, ambiguous wordings into the documents. Um, he talks about the council muscle that got these ambiguous uh, uh, paragraphs uh, into the documents. That doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters is what, in fact, does the document say? <clears throat> and if it's ambiguous, uh, it's coming from a Catholic ecumenical council. It needs to be interpreted in a Catholic way. Now, uh, after I listened to their tape, I remembered that at the council, there was a group of men called the Doctrinal Commission, or sometimes they're called the Theological Commission. Um, I think they were appointed by the Pope. I'm not sure about that. I tried to Google them to get more information about them, <clears throat> and I couldn't. I got nowhere with it, just a few little references. But <clears throat> when a bishop was voting on a document or, or a paragraph of a document, he had three ways to vote. He could vote placet, non placet, or placet juxtamodum. Placet means yes, I agree. Uh, non placet means I don't agree. And placet juxtamodum means I sort of agree. Something has to be changed. And when those placet juxtamodums, those would go to this, this commission, this theological commission, and they would either change the wording, if a lot of bishops wanted to change, or they would explain why they didn't have to change the wording. And in doing that, they gave the meaning of the text. They said the text means X, it doesn't mean Y, and therefore... Orthodoxy is preserved, and so we don't have to change it. So uh, in many cases, I'm thinking if there are ambiguous um, paragraphs in some of the documents, we need to go to the Theological Commission to see were there ever any uh, placet juxtamodums that they explained, their explanation would be the understanding of what that text means. And... Um, that was not mentioned at all uh, in this talk that uh, Tim, Rich, and Christopher gave. And like I say, I've had trouble pinning them down. But it seems to me that uh, if we want to know uh, what did the council mean, um, one classic example is the um, um, uh, 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 consistent or absistent. I've forgotten the exact Latin now. It's subsistent, subsistent in that the ch that the true church subsists in the Catholic Church instead of saying the true church is the Catholic Church. Um, so, some people make all kinds of mischievous understandings of what that means, uh, but the I do I do uh, uh, I did get a hold of what the commission said about that. They were saying what the council is trying to say is that the Catholic Church is the fullness of what Christ left and the other churches have parts of that. 
That's what they were trying to say. Uh, so if that's how we are to understand subsisted in, then that does away with objections that the council taught that all churches are equal or that, um, uh, uh, that the Catholic Church is not the one church of Christ. Uh, another example that I got uh, in looking up the Theological Commission <clears throat> was there were some theologians uh, like Father Skilobex, I don't know if he was actually included in this particular instance, who wanted the, the uh, document on the church to say that uh, you have two sources of authority, the Pope over here and a council over here, and that a council could um, settle an issue or speak with authority just as much as the Pope. And um, these theologians were having a meeting, this is how the story goes anyway, where they were spelling out how they were going to try to get this teaching, ambiguous teaching, into the document on the church, Lumen Gentium. Then they left the room and they left their notes on the table and another priest who had been in that room previous to their being in there and had left his breviary in there, went back into the room to get his breviary and he saw the notes on the table. He read them. He realized what was at stake. They were trying to create two magisteriums, the Pope as one and a council as another. And he brought that to Pope Paul VI and explained it to Pope Paul VI what was at stake. And uh, the story goes that when Pope Paul VI realized he was being betrayed, he wept. But then when he was through weeping, he got a hold of the Theological Commission and had them straighten, that up, them, uh, straighten this thing out. And what they did was to put this nota previa, it's like a, an opening note, to the chapter on the uh, Episcopal College, the, the College of Bishops. And the note said that the College of Bishops uh, is always headed by the Pope, and it does not exist without the Pope as head. And so by saying that, they clarified the ambiguity that was running through that chapter, so that if you want to know what does that chapter mean, how are we to interpret the ambiguous phrases, you go to the Nota Previa, and there it is. Uh, the, the, uh, com the bishops uh, never exist as a, as a college or as a council without the Pope as head. So you have just one magisterium. Now you can have, so the bottom line here is you can have something that is ambiguous and capable of a heretical understanding uh, in, a, in a document, and it doesn't make the document heretical. It doesn't make the document wrong. It simply makes the document ambiguous uh, and needing to be, uh, again, needing to be interpreted in a Catholic sense. An example of that would be the, uh, and they, uh, Tim and his friends spent a lot of time talking about this uh, on their video, the document on the liturgy, the reform of the liturgy. The document said that um, there needs to be a, a, re a return uh, to the uh, noble simplicity of the Roman rite. Now, that is ambiguous. Uh, uh, what is this noble simplicity? And how do we return to it? And does that mean eliminating this? Does that mean eliminating that? Um, what exactly does it mean? The Council Fathers probably thought that that phrase would be interpreted in, in the light of the basic rules for how, you re, how the liturgy develops, um, which include the liturgy develops, first of all, by using wise scholarship and uh, by making very small incremental changes. Uh, the actual reforms that came after the Council did neither. Examples of, of a wise reform of the liturgy would be adding the name of St. Joseph to the canon. Uh, John the Twenty-Third did that before the Council even opened. Um, putting the readings in the vernacular, 
the council did ask for some English or some uh, vernacular being uh, put into the liturgy. So that would be one way that a reasonable reform could be made. Um, promoting congregational chant for the Curie and the Gloria, for, its, for example. Promoting the study of liturgical Latin in Catholic grade schools at First Communion classes and so forth. As I say, the actual implementation um, did neither of those things. So um, we have to then distinguish between what the document of the council said and the implementation that was done after the council. And even if the implementation claims to be done in the name of the council, it still is something separate from the council. And as Rich pointed out, uh, the council is a teaching, but the implementation of the council is a passing laws. It's making legislation. It's not teaching. Now, We have to distinguish between those two things. Insofar as the council document is teaching, we have to accept that docilely and work with it. We have to avoid, as Richard said, having the attitude, I'm right and the church is wrong. And um, their video went into that at, at length. I won't go into that here. But, so that's when the council is teaching. But after the council, when the church is legislating, that you can disagree with uh, mentally and verbally. And you, can, uh, you can see that, you can recognize, for example, that a certain implementation of the council, it was unwise. Uh, it, it didn't correspond to what the council asked for and so forth. Examples of that would be uh, the reduction of the communion fast. The communion fast used to be from midnight, and then it was changed to just three hours, and then finally one hour. Um, the elimination of the offertory prayers would be another unwise implementation of, of the council. The document from Vatican II never said to do that. That was something which the implementers decided to do and did. Uh, eliminating the communion rail, eliminating the ad orientem position of the priest, uh, introducing communion in the hand. These are all things that came after the council, but they aren't caused by the council. We have to avoid the philosophical fallacy that because something happens after, because B happens after A, that A caused B. That isn't necessarily true. So to summarize this, the documents of Vatican II are part of the ordinary magisterium, the teaching, and they have to be accepted. Uh, Sacro Sanctum Concilium, that's the document on the liturgy, uh, authorized a wise reform of the Roman Rite and um, was expecting that to be implemented according to the uh, commonly accepted norms of liturgical development. He wanted the Roman Rite to be, to be more itself. It didn't want it to be something else. Uh, so that's number, number one, the documents. Number two, the implementation. We can disagree with the implementation. That is not the same thing as the documents. Uh, we can see the implementation as being unwise. We can see it as being a betrayal of the council and a betrayal of the liturgical tr tradition. That's all legitimate, but that's different from saying that the documents themselves are heretical. And the bottom line then with regard to the documents is they have to be read, whether they're written clearly or not so clearly, in a Catholic way. That means in continuity with the Catholic past. That's what, in, that's what determines the true meaning of the documents, not the intent of theologians or mischievous bishops. Uh, uh, and uh, so it doesn't, it isn't determined by what they intended or we think they intended, and it's not determined by uh, mischievous legislators after the council. So those are my thoughts about 
that particular video. Thank you.